Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing free radicals. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. With that being said, let's review what free radicals are in case you forgot. Free radicals are just uncharged molecules that have one additional or additional unpaired valence electrons, okay? And these are usually chemical species that you need to be aware of because they play a big role, not just physiologically, but also pathologically. Usually these organisms or these molecules are are highly reactive that's why they're so dangerous but they're also short-lived meaning they're not gonna hang around for a while but because they're so highly reactive they have the ability to cause out of injury and they usually pertain to oxygen that's the main thing you need to remember it's for free radicals in terms of the human body you need to remember that they're gonna deal with oxygen and all the effects they have and all the mechanism of injury they they perform are by oxygen so you have physiologic and pathologic generation of free radicals the physiologic generation is gonna be dependent on oxidative phosphorus relation primarily okay so that means cytochrome c oxidase is going to transfer electrons to oxygen molecules in order to generate ATP. Remember, oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor. Think back to your biochem classes that you have definitely forgotten. Oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor in oxidative phosphorylation. It's gonna continuously uh, accept electrons until you form water. So a partial reduction in oxidative phosphorylation will always yield in free radicals until such a time where you have a complete reduction. And a complete reduction is actually going to generate water, H2O. So let's look at that really quickly. We're starting off with oxygen right here. And once oxygen accepts one free electron, it's going to become an oxygen free radical right here. Then it's going to continuously accept electrons right here and right here and right here. The second free electron is going to form hydrogen peroxide. The third free electron is going to form the hydroxide free radical. And then the last or the fourth free electron is going to form uh, H2O. So this is your complete reduction. But like we said earlier, if you have partial reduction, meaning if you stop the reduction anywhere short of the fourth electron, okay, you are going to have the formation of these free radicals, oxygen free radical, hydroxide, hydrogen peroxide, excuse me, and the hydroxide free radical. So when it comes to the pathologic generation, then you need to understand what's also happening. Ionizing radiation can cause uh, uh, free radicals to form, especially the, uh, the hydroxide free radical, that's the most common uh, free radical formation. Inflammation can cause free radicals to form, and that's kind of pathophysiologic in my opinion because realistically, white blood cells need to defend themselves and defend your body. So what they're going to do is they're going to have an oxidative burst where they release a lot of free radicals. Free radical release in order to kill any infections or anything that is pathologic in our bodies. Metals can also cause free radicals to form, especially iron, and that's why they are bound to iron. Uh, uh, iron is bound to carrier proteins, same with copper. Chemicals can cause free radicals. One of the classic chemicals is carbon tetrachloride. You need to know about that. We're going to talk about that in a second. The metabolism of drugs, especially phase one metabolism, forms free radicals as well as redox reactions. The key thing you need to remember, however, is this. Oxygen, sorry, hydroxide free radical, this one is the most dangerous of all free radicals, meaning most injury that occurs pathologically is going to occur from the hydroxide free radical. Now, when it comes to the injury, the, the free radicals can cause damage to cellular functions, and they do that by attacking the membrane, right? So they can cause membrane lipid peroxidation and ruin the membrane. They can modify proteins so that they don't function properly. You can even have DNA breakage, right? And this can actually lead to cancer. So free radical injury is associated with neoplasm and cancer formation. And then it can also induce cellular apoptosis. If a cell realizes it's damaged, it's just going to undergo apoptosis in order to prevent further injury occurring in the body. 
when now, even though we do have free radicals that are formed, we have to have a way of eliminating them, right? We talked about this, this pathologic and physiologic uh, formation of free radicals. Well, if you're forming these free radicals, you have to have some way of getting rid of the free radicals. The way we do that is essentially, number one, you have spontaneous decay. Free radicals, like we said earlier, is that they're short-lived. And because they're short-lived, they will decay spontaneously. They, uh, you can also use antioxidants, and antioxidants are a barrier um, it's a protection for free radicals. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of supplements in the media, online, that are saying, oh, this is an antioxidant. It'll prevent cancer. The way these antioxidants function is that they prevent or they eliminate free radicals so that you don't have free radical injury occurring. And thus, you technically reduce the risk of developing cancer because we know free radical injury puts you at a higher risk of developing cancer. So these antioxidants are vitamin A, C, E, uh, these are antioxidants that you need to be aware of. Metal carrier proteins can definitely reduce uh, the free radical and uh, reduce the production of free radicals. So this is going to be transferrin, which is the iron carrier protein, and ceruloplasm, plasmin, which is the copper carrier protein. And then finally, you have these scavenging enzymes. I think this is probably the most important thing you need to remember for any exam that deals with uh, free radical and free radical injury. So the scavenging enzymes are enzymes that function along the pathway that we discussed earlier for the, um, the oxygen reduction pathway, right? So when oxygen is getting reduced. These are going to be enzymes like superoxide dismutase or SOD, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase. Like I said, these function at different points of that pathway. So let's just look at where they function so you have a good understanding of what's happening. Essentially, this is the, the original slide that we talked about. But as you can see, we've added the the enzymes, the um, the scavenging enzymes. What these enzymes essentially do is that they take this free radical Either for uh, superoxide dismutase, they take superoxide, and they're going to essentially neutralize them by creating some other um, some other uh, substance or some other chemical structure or compound. That's what they do. And by being able to neutralize the free radical formation, they're able to reduce the injury that's happening in our body. Now, one thing to remember is that not only do we have these scavenging enzymes, bacteria also have these scavenging enzymes, specifically catalase, which is very important, okay? Some bacteria have the ability to negate or to reduce the effect of hydrogen peroxide because they are catalase positive and they have the catalase enzyme so that when we go through oxidative burst by the white blood cells, those bacteria will not get killed by free radical injury. And now one of the chemicals you need to know is carbon tetrachloride. This is a very classic uh, chemical that gets tested a lot. So you need to understand what's happening. This is something that's commonly used in dry cleaners. And if the vignette has someone who's a dry cleaner, start thinking about carbon tetrachloride and free radical injury. Usually carbon tetrachloride is going to enter the blood and then it's going to become carbon trichloride, a free radical form right? And essentially, this is going to happen because of the CYP450 enzyme in the liver, and it's going to end up damaging the hepatocytes. Very important. Carbon tetrachloride attacks essentially or causes damage to the liver. The initial stage is going to be a reversible damage, and that's, uh, that's characterized by cellular swelling. We've discussed that in our previous videos. The uh, Eventually, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to see protein synthesis decreasing. And the decrease is going to essentially cause a loss of apolipoproteins, apo which are very important for passing fat and uh, uh, cholesterol in our body, especially the low density and high density lipoproteins. Fat is going to enter the liver, but because you don't have any apolipoproteins, you're not going to be able to remove the fat, and that's going to cause a fatty liver or a fatty liver change to occur in the liver, and that's going to essentially destroy the liver. That is so important to understand. This slide is very important. In the liver, you're going to see central lobular necrosis like this. As you can see, this is a side of the liver and in the histology side you see these big fat globules they shouldn't be here we know that the liver doesn't look like this normally and these fat globules should clue to clue, give you a clue excuse me that you are going through a fatty change in the liver okay now in 
the liver. Now, if the vignette gives you a dry cleaner or someone who works in the dry cleaning in the industry, okay, they have jaundice, okay, and they have high cholesterol levels, it's probably because they can't get rid of the fat molecules that are building up because they have destroyed or they have lost the apolipoproteins, okay? Because our liver is not able to um, synthesize those proteins. Another way that radical free radical injury can occur is through something called reperfusion injury. This is one of the major causes of free radical injury that occurs after a thrombolytic event. Okay, so let's say you have a thrombus that forms in a blood vessel, and you are able to cause that you're able to destroy this thrombus and reperfuse. Right, you're able to reperfuse the blood flow. One of the things that can happen is that free radicals can form. Uh, and one of the classic locations is the heart. So let's say you block off blood supply to the heart. And when you block off that blood supply and you lyse the thrombus and you treat the patient, you're going to end up seeing a patient get worse. Right, The return of the blood that's, that goes to the tissue that was destroyed actually is going to end up producing more free radicals. That is very important. That's going to cause further damage. That's called reperfusion injury. And essentially, you're going to end up seeing a increase in the cardiac enzymes like troponin, and you're going to see a worsening of the condition, which shouldn't make any sense, right? You might be thinking, oh, you know, you lysed the clot, you took care of the thrombus, the patient should be getting better, but now they're getting worse. Most likely, there's some sort of reperfusion injury occurring by free radical formation. With that being said, that's everything you need to know. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot. And we'll see you back here real soon.